Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 84 of Screw the Commute podcast. We've got a longtime buddy of mine. His name is Art Subcheck, and you don't even think about trying to spell it, but uh, he's a guy that is the, the greatest. He's the greatest at something I absolutely hate. So <laughs> very interested to hear what he has to say about it today. Now, I hope you didn't miss last episode, 83, with Carla Rieger. Carla grew up in a, in a family with absolutely zero humor, zero tolerance, and she, she switched her whole life around. She went to improv classes, and uh, now she, uh, she has Mind Story Academy. So she teaches you how to really change your, your mindset using uh, the stories of your life. Now, we want you to download the new podcast app we have. It makes it really great to listen on your tablets and your mobile devices, and it even has all, all kinds of cool features. Like uh, if, you're, if you're in the car and the phone rings, it'll pause the podcast and then start playing after you hang up. So all these kinds of things. We even have instructions on how to use all the advanced features. You can check that out at screwthecommute.com slash app. Screwthecommute.com slash A-P-P. Now, we are starting a monthly youth episode where... I highlight a young person that's doing great entrepreneurial things. So you can email me at orders at antion.com, orders at antion.com. Of course, that'll be in the show notes uh, for details on how a young person can apply to be featured. And our our first young person was Tiffany Hawkins, who's a young girl helping other young girls. So check out her episode. Now, our sponsor this week, hey, it's me again. Uh, Big surprise, right? And the the Internet Marketing uh, Retreat and Joint Venture Program, where myself and my staff work with you for a year to either get you started in an Internet business or to use the Internet to take your existing business to the next level. I'll tell you more about that later. And the details will be at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. Greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. And, of course, they'll be in the show notes. All right, let's get to the main event. Over the past 30 years, Art Subject has helped salespeople worldwide say the right things to get through, get in, and sell, primarily using the phone. He's a speaker, trainer, author, and marketer of his training products. His flagship book, Smart Calling, How to Eliminate the Fear, Failure, and Rejection from Cold Calling, hit number one in Amazon's sales category in the very first day. Art, are you ready to screw the commute? That's a <laughs> heck of a place for a comma, Tom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. oh. Yes, I am. Thank uh, you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. It's been a while. You've been to, you've been to the house before, and uh, uh, it's been a long time since um, – We've uh, had a chance to talk, but tell everybody what you, what you actually do right now. Well, what, what I do, what I've been doing for my entire career is helping salespeople and those who don't necessarily have sales in their title, but nevertheless need to sell, which is most business people. What I do is I help them use the right words to get through, get in and sell more effectively without this thing called rejection. I'm using air quotes right there. <laughs> and and I do that through a variety of different means. As you mentioned in the in the introduction, I'm a, I'm a speaker and trainer, but also have a, a lot of of information available online, both free and things that people can can invest in as well in a variety of different mediums. Now, uh, you heard me say, and you probably run into a lot of people like me that just can't stand it. Uh, What would you say to to people uh, about the benefits of getting over that uh, hurdle of hating this this type of uh, marketing? Well, are, are you talking about sales in general or, no, or just this thing uh, getting called on the cold phone, calling? Getting on the phone, cold calling, yeah. Right, right. Well, it's, it, it's funny, Tom, because so so many things in sales have negative labels attached to them and they have over the years. 
which I, I think perpetuates the, the the negative image of salespeople and the negative experience that a lot of salespeople have. But but really, when you think about it, selling professionally is is nothing more than than helping people, helping people buy by engaging in a conversation about what somebody wants and, and what somebody needs and, and really helping them sell themselves. So, so when people look at it from that perspective and they do it in that way and they, they do it conversationally and professionally, then, then they don't have the negative experience and they're not looking at it in, in a negative way. But if, if someone does cold calling, and again, cold is in, in quotations here, I define cold as somebody calling someone they don't know who doesn't know them and they're not expecting their call and they're just giving them this pitch where they're they're talking about uh, what they want to sell as opposed to what somebody might it, be interested in. And, and further, they don't know anything about them and everybody's getting the same pitch. Yeah, there's no wonder why people hate to place those calls and people hate to receive those calls. So that's why a long time ago, I uh, and and I've been again training for for over thirty plus years, and, and I've I've been teaching this as long as as actually I've been in business. But more formally, about ten years ago, we made it a brand, and and that was the name of the book, and and that's smart calling, which is. Uh, get this, are you sitting down oh, yeah. knowing something about the people that you call before you call them so that you can have a relevant message that is going to resonate with them as opposed to be perceived as this uh, fast talking cold caller. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so right there it reframes it a little bit for me because uh, I, uh, you know, just had such a negative thought about it. It, 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 it. To me, it felt like begging for work and, uh, and so you're saying to really research the person and, and have a conversation that, that hits it from the, the get-go rather than having to try to do that on the phone with them, right? Well, I mean, as you know, as, as an expert marketer and, and copywriter, what what you're trying to do, and, and I, I do the same thing as a marketer, is that we, we, we try to talk to one person out there. We try to talk to our audience. What is it that they want? What are they looking for? What, what's going to resonate with them? What's relevant for them? And, and that's exactly what we want to do when we're making a phone call. Uh, gone are the days when somebody can just smile and dial and, and throw a pitch out there and have people say, oh yeah, sure, I'll meet with you. Uh, we're we're inundated with, I mean, the latest number I saw was around 3,000 messages per day through a mm -hmm. variety of different means, and we're ignoring all but just a few of them. And the only way a salesperson is going to have the chance to have their message have any impact at all is if it appeals to that person right at that point in time. And it, it, it's got to be personalized, it's got to be customized, and it's got to relate to something that's going on in their world or in their mind so that they're going to stop what they're doing, lean in and say, hmm, okay, there might be something here for me. Okay, so um, all right, you're you're warming me up a little bit here, but uh, let's uh, let's get back to that a little later. And I want to take you back because this, of course, is an entrepreneurial podcast. To where did you get started? Uh, did you uh, have jobs and uh, and work for a living in the beginning? I I did actually. I I had all kinds of jobs, just about every job that you could think of in in high school and, and in college. Most of them were sales jobs. I was, I was actually a DJ for my four years of college. So I played about 400 wedding receptions wow. and, and parties, which was, which was a great job, which actually was great training for, for what I do now, both the speaking and the sales part. Well, and you get, you the, get the, the interesting thing that- coming up I'm sorry? You, you get a lot of drunk people coming up to you in the, in nowadays. Like oh the, yeah, I can't tell you parties. how many times people came up and said, "Dude, can you play Freebird?" Freebird, Freebird, yeah. <laughs> so, and, which you know is not a great dance song, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and and my favorite line is, you know, I'll see if I can get to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, except one guy came up to me, and this was in the the I think it was 1980. And he came up to me with three hundred dollars and said, "Can you play Freebird?" And I said, "I will get that right on for you, sir." Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I would do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, to answer your question, I was always entrepreneurial. I was reading Entrepreneur Magazine and Inc. Magazine when when I was in college, mm -hmm. and it, it, those magazines both go back that far. Right, right. And I always knew I wanted to do my own deal. 
but by the same token, when I graduated from college, I also got married the week after I graduated, and I oh, thought, you know, I, 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 I let's go out there and get some experience, and let's get a, a let's get a little bit of uh, money coming in. So I had a number of job offers, and I took one that was attractive, mainly because it took me to Kansas City, and I'm a big Royals fan. So I uh, <laughs> took a job with the old AT and T in sales, and as it turns out, I was working at their their flagship. Uh, they didn't use the term call center then. They called it the, the Bell System Sales Center, which was a, a, a telemarketing center. They were selling telemarketing, which wasn't a bad word at the time, and essentially was showing businesses how they could how they could use the phone to to get more business. That's how they could that's how they could sell more of their services. And from from the first day, I I was trying to figure out how can I go out and do this on my own. Well. It only took about eight months before I left, and and I actually left with a partner who had the same idea, and we left out. We left, and I was at the the ripe old age of twenty three, and started a consulting firm, uh, a telemarketing consulting firm, showing well, no. companies okay, how they could on. use the phone. Hold on, hold on. So uh, uh, that you got the idea, and you said it took about eight months. Were you planning your exit, or did you just one day say I'm gone? Uh, did you save up some money? How did you make that transition from uh, the, the corporate paycheck to going out on your own? Y- uh, yes, to, to a couple of your questions. I was planning my exit the entire time because I'm always thinking, okay, how, how am I going to be able to do this on my own? So we were consulting with clients, again, over the phone, how they could implement an inside sales department. At the, by, by, at the same time, I'm honing my skills on, and, and of course, getting some great education in, in how to do that. And in, in the meantime, I'm planning, okay, how are we going to make our break? What are we going to do? But also, here's a great lesson for the audience. I also made a huge mistake in that we didn't have clients in hand with with revenue from day one. Mm-hmm. And then we also made the mistake of going out and renting an office and, and buying office furniture. Uh, so, so that's not recommended. Yeah, I, I think I bought all the stuff that you uh, got rid of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I went to Craig, I furnished my entire school, 4,000 square foot building with gorgeous cherry desks and everything for $1,500. And any one of them would have cost $1,500. But, uh, you know, some other business made that mistake. And then they had, they went out of business because they bought all this stuff and didn't have the revenue. So it was in a, it was in a warehouse. The guy couldn't wait to get rid of it for any amount of money. And I, I did the same thing later on in life, but at, at that point, that was, uh, that was, I call it tuition. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, liquidated uh, damages, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> so you made the uh, transition. Now, tell us about the partner. You, you, you had a partner, right? Because I'm very skeptical of partnerships. So how did that work out, and how did you decide to have a partner instead of just going right on your own? As you should be skeptical of, of partners, <laughs> or, or I shouldn't say skeptical. I should say careful. Careful. And w- when we both left, of course, we were both cocky and talented. And he he was not married at the time. I was, and I had a wife bringing in some revenue. And we weren't bringing in a lot of revenue right at the beginning, as most small businesses don't. We were bringing in just enough to pay some bills and just enough for him to pay his bills. So uh-huh. because I had money coming in, or we, I had money coming in through my wife, and uh, he didn't. Of course, he was, he was taking a salary. And then, and, and as sometimes uh, partnerships uh, play out, one person does a lot more work than the other one. Mm-hmm. And you might guess who that one was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was me. And, and and the way it ended up is that he decided he didn't want to be in business. He wanted to go to law school, which he did. So I say at least one of us still has a reputable profession. <laughs> <laughs> no, no insult to the attorneys right. out there. Uh, but he he did eventually leave, and it uh, it I mean there was some resentment there because he left owing the company a lot of money, which which of course was never was never paid back. But but the thing here, I mean, the lesson for future entrepreneurs is if, if you're going to go into a partnership, make sure your, your roles are pretty well defined as to who's going to do what and who's going to be compensated for what, which we didn't have in place. Okay. So 
Yeah, I know it's easy to get into a partnership, but I mean, really, anybody that's even considering that should get an attorney and uh, look at all the po- the possibilities because it's easy to get in. It's getting out that can cause enormous trouble. You need to know what if some one person becomes incapacitated? What if they just want to leave? How's what's the buyout? Do you have insurance on each other? You know, all of these kinds of things uh, can affect it. Nobody thinks about that when they're all starry-eyed about getting started in business, but it can really tear you up in the, on the back end. Uh, go ahead. Yes, exactly. Great points. And and we we didn't have that type of agreement. Plus, I was the one who, who put in pretty much all of the money. <laughs> so. Yeah, so all of those things, yeah, have to be, uh, have to be written out uh, equitably and if and if somebody won't sign it, that's the first person will screw you, you know. So, so uh, really, uh, it, going through that process can can show a lot about the other person that you may not realize when you're all excited about getting started in business. All right, so uh, so let's get back to your your expertise and how it could help uh, a business. Now, give us some tips on on uh, smart calling. I was going to say cold calling, but I changed my mind and said smart calling. Well, I'm glad that's that's the first step in the process. Well, uh, again, it's it's a relatively simple concept, and and that is if you desire to do business with someone, and if if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a small business, let let's face it, the fastest and least expensive way to enter a sales conversation with somebody who who doesn't know you and you've never had a relationship with and who isn't going to call you first is to pick up the phone and try to reach them. Now, the problem is too many people don't know how to do it and they call and they start talking about their thing, which is one of my favorite sayings. Don't talk about your thing. People don't buy your thing. They, they only buy a potential result. So, so what we should do instead is go through this process where we really want to understand, first of all, why would someone be interested in, in what I have to sell? And then I really need to do some research on what's going on in that person's world. And again, why would they be a prospect for me? And is there anything that might make them a better prospect for me? Maybe there's some kind of trigger event. Maybe there's something going on. In, in their world. So for example, if I'm selling, use an example, if I'm selling uh, security software of some type, and I know that a company just had a, a breach. Now, of course, that's a huge trigger event that's going to make them a more plausible prospect for, for what I have, but I probably just wouldn't want to stop at that. I'd want to know something more about What's going on in their department? What do they have in place? What are some of the implications? So in addition to doing the research that is available to everyone, which is the online research, and there's a lot of different places we could go. Of course, the the, the free biggie would be Google and LinkedIn and all those things. And there's other search engines out there that aggregate that type of information as well as social media information. There's also this thing called social engineering, which uh, is, is used pretty widely by computer hackers, but we're, we're using it for reputable purposes. Social engineering is simply calling into a company and asking questions of someone other than your decision maker to get some more sales intelligence about what might be going on so that we can now tailor a message that is going to resonate more with that individual. Yeah. So let's say, for example, I find out from somebody else in the IT department that they they have this initiative in place where they're looking at uh, again not being technical um, I'm just kind of making this up but but there's something that they're working on so now I'm going to craft my message using a a proven process that we use and that message would go something like this hey Tom Art Subcheck here with a security software and uh, I understand you're you're probably getting a lot of calls from people that want to talk to you about your security uh, I also understand that something you're working on right now very specifically is then I would mention this. Well, we've been successful in working with other IT departments in the manufacturing space in helping them too. And and again, you'd fill in the blank Mm -hmm. there with your possible benefit. And and then I would end with, and I'd simply like to ask you a couple questions, see if we might have the basis for for, uh, further conversation. 
So, so what I've done there is I've related that. I know something about you. I've talked about some possible value. And within that possible value, I've mentioned some social proof. So I've worked with others doing that. And notice I haven't talked about the thing. I haven't talked about the software. I also didn't ask for a decision, which so many salespeople do today. They call up and you probably get these calls. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tom, what I'd like to do is to uh, you know, take 15 minutes of your time or schedule a meeting with you or get you on a web demo. It's like, no, it's way too early for that. The biggest decision we want them to make at this point is to stay on the phone with you for another 15, 20, 30 seconds. And then we continue earning the right to stay on the phone with them. Now, your goal at this point could be an appointment, or it might be just to engage them right there in, in a further conversation. But all I want to do here is get them to simply say, yeah, sure. Okay. What do you want to know? Well, uh, the only flaw I see in that, in that example that you made up is that, um, the FBI knocks on your door. How did you know about this, <laughs> this software? <laughs> well, here's, here's, here's the funny thing is that when I teach this in, in workshops and seminars, mm -hmm. if, if people aren't doing it and if they have a little bit of resistance, they're going to say, people are busy. Yeah, are, are, are they going to answer questions or they're not going to answer questions? And, and my response to that is just try it. People are conditioned to answer questions if you ask them. I mean, we've been answering questions our entire lives. Mm -hmm. Now, I also have a process where we, we give a reason for asking. So, for example, if I call into, uh, I, I mean, in, in our case, we'll call into sales departments and we'll, and we'll talk to salespeople because, of course, we're selling sales training and we, and we all know salespeople like to talk, right? So <laughs> we'll call into the sales department, I'll get a salesperson on the phone and say, yeah, hey, hey, Tom, Art Subcheck here with Business by Phone. First of all, I want to let you know, I'm, I'm not a prospect for you, but I'm going to be speaking to your VP of sales. And uh, before I do, there's probably some information you could help me with. I want to make sure I'm prepared. Uh, so tell me, I, I see that you guys are doing cold calling there, and then I go into the questions. So, so what I did there was I, I gave a reason, and what this does is th this actually follows Cialdini's principle right. of the because. Mm -hmm. because any any time you make a request, if you give a reason for it, as as minimal or as or as stupid as it might be, it is proven that people will give you more and better information. Yeah, let's stop for a second. Uh, and tell them about uh, Robert Cialdini's book. Uh, it's called Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. I probably wrote it, read it seven times, and everybody I know that makes a lot of money has. So uh, that's what he's talking about with Cialdini. So, uh, again, if, if, if you're a salesperson, and or not even a salesperson, but you need to sell, the more information that you get and the more you're able to tailor your initial opening and your, your benefit statement, I actually call it your possible value proposition, the more conversations you're going to enter into because now people are talking about their favorite subject, which is themselves. I think your, your first name is perfect because it seems to me there's an art to this. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's, a, that's actually the name of my podcast, The Art of Sales. There you go. But, Perfect. <laughs> but actually, it, it is, Tom. There, it, It's part art, no pun intended, but it's part science mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, so yeah, anybody I mean, can the, learn to do this. It doesn't, you know, it's not like you have to be a, a Michael uh, uh, Angelo painter uh, to, to, to really do well with this. I mean, sir, I'm sure some people do better than others, but you can learn these skills, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, <laughs> I, I always suggest that there's no born salespeople any more than there are born airline pilots, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there is an art and a science. The science part most definitely can be learned by looking at the process and the words and the mechanics. And then the art part is the performance part. And the performance part comes from applying the, the, the scientific part, learning all we can, but then it, it's a matter of doing it, but doing the right things in the right way. Yeah, it's it's kind of like golf. Sometimes people will say, "Oh, geez, I, I'd I'd be better if I just played more." I mean, I was playing with a guy. We got got hooked up with uh, with a single, 
and the guy was absolutely awful. And, and he'd just spray his drives out, out of bounds. And he'd just say, man, if I, if I just got to play more, I'd be better. I'm thinking to myself, no, you wouldn't. You'd just be better at being bad because you're not <laughs> doing the right thing. His swing was horrible. So if, if, if somebody knows the right things to do and then they, they practice it and then they learn from their mistakes, it's like anything else. Yeah, you, you can be great at this. Some of the best salespeople I've ever been around, I've been around some very wealthy salespeople, they weren't what you would call naturals. But you know what? They, they worked harder than almost anybody else, and they had the desire to be better. Mm -hmm. So anything uh, crazy, funny, bizarre ever happened on one of these calls or during this uh, your career? Well... Yeah, and actually, it, it wasn't necessarily on a call. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that that's that's happened on calls. <laughs> but uh, let, let me share an experience. Being a a speaker, and you know this because I know you you were on the road for a while, and I certainly put my time in with over a million miles and you know, my share of hotel meeting rooms. So this is probably about fifteen years ago. I had a client that a lot of people might be familiar with. It's uh, Vitamix, you know, the blender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had done a program for them and they called me maybe two years later and said, hey, we're ready for a refresher. <clears throat> Can you come out? You pretty much repeat the same thing you did a couple of years ago. Hey, yeah, that's awesome. So we set the date. It was a couple of months in the future. And at the time I was using a travel agency. So I called up the travel agency. I said, hey, I need to book a trip to Atlanta for these days this time. Da, da, da. OK, done deal. So day comes. I get on the flight like I normally do. I get my rental car. I get out on the Beltway. And you're probably familiar with Atlanta, mm -hmm. right? So yep. you get out of the airport, you got that beltway there. We got the interstate. So I'm driving down the interstate and I'm going, hmm, you know, this actually doesn't look familiar. And then I'm thinking, <laughs> wait a minute, Vitamix is in Cleveland, <laughs> not Atlanta. <laughs> now, I mean, Come on, give me a break here. Outside the airport of Cleveland and Atlanta, you kind of got the little Beltway Industrial. <laughs> right. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> but, so luckily, I uh, I was able to rush back to the rental car place, dump the car off. I just screamed at him saying, don't need it. You know, go ahead and charge me, whatever. And I, I, I was booking a new flight, which luckily I was able to get one that night to Cleveland and uh, got in late at night. And it, it only cost me about $500 out of my own pocket <laughs> for, for that, that screw up. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we could probably do many, many issues on travel crazy stories. You know, I remember one time I, some right before I had to go into a luncheon program, I had to fly in in the morning and it was uh, three degrees below zero. And <laughs> the guy sitting next to me, as soon as we got up off the plane, spilled a whole Diet Coke on my lap, just soaked me. And I Ooh. go outside and my pants freeze. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, like I said, we were all, um, uh, did you hear lately they're, they're going to reduce the size of the airline bathroom so they can fit in a couple more chairs. And I'm thinking, I can't fit into it now. Uh, they should just put a porta potty at each seat, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know how how some people right now fit in fit in the seats. Oh my god, goodness! Yeah, I mean, I lost a hundred pounds since the last time you saw me, and uh, really, yeah, yeah. It's I've been on this ketogenic uh, lifestyle kind of. It's uh, very low carb, moderate protein, high fat, and it's uh, mm -hmm. it's been really great. But, well, good uh, for you. but anyway, uh, what do you like best about working for yourself and what's the worst part? Well, it, it, it's actually all I can remember, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I could not imagine working for someone else where I was not in total control of my destiny and my income and what, what I chose to do each and every day. And I, I know it's not for everybody. But uh, again, just the, the thought of being able to, and you can relate to this, the thought of being able to, to wake up one day, get an idea and say, you know, I, I'd like to generate $10,000 because I, I want to go on this trip. So then what we do is we come up with a campaign and uh, write some copy, make an offer, and and send it out to the list. Now I don't, don't want people to think that 
you know, it, it's, uh, it, internet marketing is, is get rich quick overnight. All you need to do is send an email and, 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 you know, you know, being the, the, the scam buster that you are, there are people that teach that, but <laughs> the, the, the fact is if, if you've done the right things over the years and you build up your tribe and you deliver value and you, 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 uh, have credibility and, and people put trust in you. If if you come up with a good offer that truly is going to deliver more than what they're investing, you're, you're capable of doing that. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. I, I've done it. I do it regularly, and I and I know you do yep. as well from from the offers that I get from you. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I can't imagine any, working for anybody else. I can't imagine. See, for, for me, I'm tef, uh, definitely anti corporate because I couldn't sit in a in uh, two weeks of committee meetings just to go to the bathroom, you know, <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. I want uh, fast speed to market and, uh, and people that never did anything, you know, or sometimes above you because of nepotism. And I was like, Oh man, I would get, I would murder somebody if I was in that situation. But what's the worst part? There's gotta be some downsides to this, right? Well, I think, I think the worst part could also be the best part. The, the worst part, if I had to pick a negative, is that when, and, and I'm a pretty much a solopreneur, I mm -hmm. had staff at one point, and I, I had an office building, and, and I always knew I was not a good manager. Mm -hmm. so many entrepreneurs yeah. aren't. I, I, I wasn't great at delegating. So anyway, to, today, I'm just pretty much by myself. I use some, use some VAs. Uh, so the worst part would be when you're working all by yourself, you're, you're a committee of one, mm -hmm. which means you could be a little bit isolated from other ideas, other people out there. So therefore, you've got to make sure that you are inserting yourself in situations where you're continuing to uh, associate with people when you want to. Uh, because you, you may not always want to, which could also be the best part because mm -hmm. you don't have to put up with all the crap right, and the right. politics and, and, and all of that. So, so what I make sure that, that I do is, uh, of course, when I'm speaking, I'm out there and, and I am kind of in the corporate world. So I, so I see those things and I'm thankful that, that I'm, that I'm not in it full time, but also involved in, in mastermind groups and, and associating with, with other like-minded successful people which is very important when when you're an entrepreneur you're uh, if, if, if you're you're not continually getting new ideas whether it be you're just going out and seeking education reading it consuming it through videos audios i mean your stuff uh we, we most definitely should be associating with other people who are at your level and and higher the the levels that you aspire to yeah and uh, yeah even in our own little company here i you know twice a week i got you know it's mostly young people compared to me and i want that because you know they're uh, they're in tune with you know what's the latest social media what's this and that and uh, i encourage them to let let me know give me ideas i don't scare them away like oh i'm the big kahuna and don't you know don't you know challenge me i want to hear what's going on because they're in a different world than me you know so uh, you got to keep uh, yeah you got to keep your mind open Oh, ab absolutely. You know, it's, I think it's popular for people of, of our age group to to bash millennials. But I am absolutely amazed by the millennials who are doing amazing things out there. Matter of fact, I was uh, my, my girlfriend was just talking to an 18 year old yesterday who's just started this Instagram business. And, and he's partners with a 21 year old mm -hmm. who had just sold a social media business for get this a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're doing <laughs> stuff. I mean, the kid, yeah. the first kid, I don't know if you remember Ilya worked for me. I've recruited him out of comp USA, which I don't think exists anymore, but, uh, and in 10th grade and he's just on his third startup. He's a millionaire in, in Los Angeles now. Uh, the latest was called Pluto.tv. Mass, I think they got fifty million dollars in funding. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, these uh, these kids. Uh, yeah, I agree that I have a little trouble with work ethic and things from uh, our generation. You actually worked and got paid. Now, I guess you work only one percent of the hour and then get. Paid. <laughs> I don't know how it works nowadays, but. But uh, I tell you what, they got they're in tune with a lot of things. So, so what kind of stuff do you have that could help our listeners? So you, you you got books. What else you got? Well, I, I mentioned the the podcast, and and I got to say, you were partly responsible for my inspiration for for the podcast. 
sometimes we hear things enough and, and it finally sinks in. <laughs> well, I totally <laughs> poo pooed them for years because nobody was making any money. It was kind of an ego trip for people. But now with the advent of automobiles being able to play podcasts directly, uh, it's exceeded the listenership of XM radio uh, and they're free. And uh, the Amazon Echoes, where people can just say, hey, play, screw the commute, and it starts playing in their house, you know. So it's a different world, and people are making some really big money uh, from these now. Well, here's the, here's the funny thing. Way back in the day when they actually had these things called iPods, yeah, right. I, I actually started out and, and probably did, I don't know, 10, 15 episodes, and I called it a podcast. And at the time, it was just simply an MP3 that, that right. I had up on a website, and people could download them onto an iPod. <laughs> and 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 then after, like you said, people weren't making money with it, wasn't popular, then I would always hear about podcasts and and just um, up until probably about eight months ago, did it really get on my radar when I, you know, I, I heard about it enough. And uh, when, when people I really respected then started getting into it and doing well with it, that's when I really sat up and paid attention. So I decided to, to launch my own. And uh, we, we started in at the end of November. It's called The Art of Sales, theartofsales.com. And it's uh, conversational sales techniques for either salespeople or, or people who may not consider themselves a salesperson, but nevertheless need to sell. And, and, and again, it's just common sense type of things that anybody can use in order to, to help people buy. Yeah. And uh, all us entrepreneurs still have to sell. I mean, there's no getting around that. It's just you have to sell in one fashion or the other. So uh, you can't bury your head and think, oh, I'll just sit back and I'm in business now. Well, good. You're going to hear the crickets chirping. So uh, so we got to take a brief uh, break for our sponsor, which is usually me. Uh, and then when we come back, we're going to ask Art, uh, what's a typical day look like for him and how he stays motivated? Now, folks, uh, I kind of turned internet marketing training, uh, the, the world of that, on its head around the year 2000. See, people like me were charging fifty dollars to $100,000 up front to teach what we knew to clueless business people who refused to learn it themselves. And, and uh, you know, I'm a small business advocate, and I knew many small businesses couldn't aff you know, never afford that kind of upfront money. So uh, I made all those gurus mad by charging a relatively small entry fee to my program, but I also got a percentage of profits that was capped, so you're not stuck with me forever. Uh, so for me to get my big money, you have to make way bigger money. Uh, plus, you know I'm not going to disappear on you like many of them do because I won't get my money. So I took it a step further even. Uh, I bought a big estate home and a TV studio where my students, as part of their year-long training, come and actually stay in my house for an immersion weekend as part of their year-long training. So uh, check it all out at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com, and of course, that'll be in the show notes. All right, let's get back to our main event. Art Subcheck is here. He's got a long, long career. is probably the best there is in his field. Art, what's a, a typical day look like for you? Well, when I'm in town, when I'm not on the road mm -hmm. doing training, typical day is getting up really early. I've always been an, an early riser what is um, really in mean, really? huh? Arizona. So we're either on mountain time or Pacific time, depending on if it's daylight saving. So time. what is early? What is what time? Uh, early is I'm normally at the gym between 430 and five o'clock wow. in the morning. And yeah, the way I look at that is on the East Coast, it's already, you know, mm -hmm. 6, 630 or so. So, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> uh, so, so then after that, come back, have a uh, healthy breakfast. I, I like to take care of my health. And uh, then after that, I'm, I'm into the office. And I, uh, I, I guess one, one weakness that I have is I'm not necessarily very regimented or or disciplined in okay at at six o'clock you do this 6 20 you do this sometimes i'll be all over the board so i might be working on a major project but but normally it's going to in involve uh, a little bit of social media doing 
my LinkedIn, staying up with my contacts, posting something. It uh, could be posting something in our Facebook community. It could be working on my email newsletter. So content creation is, is a big part of my day. And then also there's always some sales involved because I, I still sell every day. So if there's any follow-ups or new contacts to make, I'm, I'm actually on the phone. So I'm a salesperson first and foremost. And then also depending on if I have a speaking engagement coming up, it might involve preparation. So for example, day after tomorrow, I'm doing a national sales meeting for a office cleaning franchise and they happen to be doing it right here in Scottsdale, which is awesome. So I don't have to get, get on a plane for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm preparing the presentation for that. So there, uh, and, and a great thing about being in this business, as you know, is that there are a lot of different things that, that can be done. And it, it, it's a matter of making sure you're focusing on the, the high value activities. And aside here, how much uh, customization do you do for these groups? I pride myself on doing a lot of customization mm -hmm. for, for my clients. And I guess being the, the guy smart calling who talks about customizing your sales call. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to make sure that we're talking about their call to their market, to their prospects with the problems that they're facing. So I go through a process where I'll listen to sales calls, recorded sales calls in advance. I'll, of course, we'll, we'll do a planning meeting with the, the, the decision makers and the managers in advance. Then I'll interview the, the actual salespeople themselves to find out what's really going on out in the field. Because, of course, they'll tell me things that, uh, that the managers right. may not. Right. And, and, and then the, the, the little secret, which is not a secret to you as a speaker, is that I don't have to go in and rewrite my program every time. Uh, you know, having done this about 1,500 times, it's relatively easy for me to go in and just tweak a few things and, and make it a customized program. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the same with me as I totally pride myself. And when, when you were mentioning about research and everything, I've had great success with Google Alerts, where I just put the name, uh, keywords in of, uh, companies that if I'm going to be dealing with uh, as far in advance as I can, and then I get any news item emailed to me every every time it shows up in the news. And I went into like Hallmark Cards to speak one time, and I knew stuff that they didn't know. It just came out in the news that morning, and I walked into the meeting, and they thought I was, you know, part of the company. You know, so this uh, this really can be impressive using the the tools we have now uh, online. So. So, hey, uh, uh, you said you're uh, currently a, a solopreneur. How do you stay motivated? Well, that, that's an interesting question because being in business as long as I have and as long as you have, sometimes there are peaks and valleys, mm -hmm. as you know. Uh, and, and, and having a, a pretty good degree of success over the years, what, what can happen is sometimes we can – we can drift into complacency, which which means that you get comfortable. But when I when I start nearing the the fringes of that, what I do is I, I start romancing the business again. And what I do is start looking at what what can I do here to deliver more value to to my tribe, to my audience. And and I do get a tremendous amount of satisfaction out of that. And, you know, it, it, it might sound kind of woo-woo or altruistic, but, but, but it really is part of what I do. I get tre tremendous satisfaction out of helping people be successful. Naturally, money will flow to value, so there's a, there's a great reward in that. But what I always want to make sure that I've got several different uh, targets or projects on the drawing board and, and that gives me the why to operate at, at the breakneck pace that, that many of us entrepreneurs do. Mm -hmm. So uh, great words from a, a great salesperson. Now, any parting words for uh, our listeners? We call them screwballs that listen to, <laughs> listen to this show. So. <laughs> Well, I, I I would assume that the people listening to this are, are interested in, in entrepreneurism. Either they are one or they're looking to get into it. And I, I would say that there's there's there has been no greater time to to get into business mm -hmm. for yourself than 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 today. And 
if you're going to do it, though, make sure you do it in an educated way. Because of the, the age that we live in, the, there's never been a time when there's been more information available to us. So if you are going to go out and do it on your own, make sure you do it in an educated way. Uh, by the same token, don't don't be paralyzed by the pursuit of perfection. You're never, ever going to achieve that. But uh, I'll give you an example, Tom. I'm I'm a, a professional cook in, in the sense that I've been paid for for cooking before. I'm a, I'm a competitive barbecue cook. So oh, I, wow. I, I, done barbecue contests. And when I'll cook for a party or something, people will say, oh my God, this is the best barbecue I ever had. You should open up a restaurant. And I look <laughs> at them like, are, are you freaking crazy? Do you know the difference between cooking good barbecue and running a barbecue restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> I know. And, and, and see, that's the problem with a lot of people who go into business. They think that because they're a good technician at what they do, that that's going to translate into being a good business person. So what I would suggest is if, if you got an idea for a business, go out and get all the information you possibly can. There's probably been somebody that's done it before. So, so, so go out, get educated on it. And then the second thing is get all the way naked. Wow. Yeah. I like that. Which means <laughs> if you're going to do it, be, be all in. Don't take your clothes off halfway knowing that, well, I could, you know, I, I still have this safety net here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying give up your life savings. It'd be nice to still have a nest egg, but I'm saying if, if you're going to, if you make the decision to go into business, get into it with all your heart so that there it's just non-negotiable meaning you're going to do whatever it takes to be successful. And if you've got the desire and if you've got the ability to go out and find the knowledge and the information to make it work, that's a pretty good combination of being successful in, in working on your own. I have to boil that down to uh, be naked when you screw the commute. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why you make the big bucks Tom. you're just able to simplify things to <laughs> common denominator. oh boy oh all right there's been so good catching up with you man i didn't know about that barbecue stuff if i ever get in your neighborhood you're cooking me some bud so uh, well i gotta tell you it, it may not uh, i'm not sure all the things that go into keto but it's uh, it's definitely high protein well that's uh, yeah well, that's, i can uh, take take a vacation for the day if i see you so uh so anyway, folks, uh, get a hold of that uh, book, Smart Calling, and check out what's the podcast uh, address again? It's The Art of Sales, theartofsales.com. Theartofsales.com. Uh, check out uh, Art's podcast. Check out the Smart Calling book. If you need a great speaker on this topic, if you happen to be in a company now and uh, need somebody and are struggling with this, this is the man. He's the bomb. So... Uh, Again, thanks, Art, for coming on. Folks, If you, uh, this has been Episode 84. Coming up as 85 is crowdfunding, where you learn how to get money for your creative projects and you don't have to pay it back. How about that? And it's not Hocus Pocus either. Also, download the podcast app, and uh, we have instructions on uh, uh, how to do all that on the website, screwthecommute.com. Please leave us a review at uh, iTunes and a star rating, and I will catch you all on the next episode.